It is an honor to be here today at Southeastern. I'm so thankful for what God is doing here on this campus and how God is raising up leaders to be launched out and sent to our own country and to the nations for his glory. And our prayer is that a whole bunch of you will sense God's call to the Western United States and you would come there and join in what God's doing. I have the privilege of serving at Hope Church and have had that since that church was born in 2001, but also get the privilege of greeting you today on behalf of the North American Mission Board and would love to come alongside you in any way that we can in helping you facilitate a call of God to be about multiplying the church. I think it's imperative that we multiply the church for the expansion of the kingdom. Church planting is not a goal in and of itself. The Bible never says go plant churches. The goal is the kingdom of God expanded among every tribe, tongue, people, nation. The church is a temporary tool established by Jesus for the expansion of the kingdom. We know this because when the kingdom comes in Revelation, there's no more local church. It's the kingdom in eternity where the king is reigning. But today we're about multiplying the church for the expansion of the kingdom among every tribe, tongue, people, nation. So if, if at the North American Mission Board or through what we offer at Hope Church by way of intensives or internships or residencies, we can serve you in facilitating that call that you sense God has on your life to planting and multiplying and reproducing the church. Uh, we would love to serve you in that way if we could. Let me just say a word of prayer, and I want to jump right in for sake of time this morning. Dr. Aiken has told me that I need to be done by 1120 in Las Vegas at 748 a.m. I've never been given that much time to preach before, but uh, we'll make the most of this three hours together. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to stand in this place today. Lord, I, I know in my own experience the moments that I sat in preparation like this and how you used men and women of God to speak. And Lord, as I listened to you speak through them, you did life-altering things inside of me. And Lord, I know it's not because of their words, I know it's because of your words in them, and so that's what I ask for today. Lord, I pray this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit that the message and the preaching would not be in persuasive words of wisdom but that it would be a demonstration of your spirit and power so that the faith of those who hear would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Holy Spirit of God, have your way. It's in the name of Jesus I pray, amen. When Jesus ascended back to heaven after his death, burial, and resurrection, it was a small group of about 120 followers that gathered in an upper room waiting on and praying for the Holy Spirit to empower them so that they could begin God's glorious mission. And you know the story of what took place in those early pages in the book of Acts, how the Holy Spirit of God empowered the church and they joined in the glorious eternal redemptive mission of God. And historians and scholars tell us that within six months of that moment in Acts chapter two, that that small group of 120 believers would become over 100,000 new Christians in the city of Jerusalem. And by the end of the first century, historians and scholars go on to estimate that there were over a half a million followers of Jesus. Could you imagine today that God moving among us in this moment, we got way more than 120 in this room. Could you imagine today that God would so show up today empowered by the Holy Spirit of God that we could look back on today and say, man, there's now a half a million new followers of Jesus Christ because God began a movement here this morning. You know, the problem with us in American Christianity is we don't even expect God to do that kind of thing anymore. We're so used to showing up, going through the motions that we don't even anticipate movements of God. But I want you to know the same God that was the God in the book of Acts is the same God today, and he is moving that way in the world as we sit here. When we think about the explosion of the mission in the first century, though, we often associate it with certain names. We think about Peter. That one who stood up on the day of Pentecost, that bold preacher of the gospel, that salty fisherman who would brazenly proclaim the name of Jesus. Or we think about names like John, 
that devoted lover of Jesus who seemingly had no fear as, as demonstrated by him being the only disciple willing to stand at the foot of the cross as Jesus was being crucified. We think about men like Barnabas that we read about later on in the story of the book of Acts, that great sacrificer, that encourager, the one that was so generous as an investor and encouraging discipleship. We think about, obviously, the greatest of the names in the first century. We think about Paul, that missionary theologian who would go on to write most of the New Testament. And if we're not careful when we evaluate the first century movement of the gospel, we can look at that and we can read those stories and here's what we can, we can walk away with. Well, I'm no Peter. I'm no Barnabas. I'm no Paul. I'm not even John. Can God really use me? And it's even a more serious question concerning our obsession in North American Christianity with a cult of personality. We have a almost idolatrous relationship with personalities where we attempt to define every movement in our context with a Christian celebrity. We identify something and we'll say, oh, have you been to so-and-so's latest conference? Have you read so-and-so's latest book? Have you seen so-and-so's latest strategy for making disciples or planting churches? Are are you subscribed to so-and-so's podcast or blog? And we can be left with this heart-sinking feeling that I'm no celebrity. I've never written a bestseller. I've never preached to thousands. My picture has never been in a brochure. I've never even had an all-access backstage pass to a Christian concert. (laughs) Can God really use me? Maybe you're sitting here and you're in the middle of your study and you've watched the guys that come here and speak and you've read their books and you've seen their blogs and their podcasts and you're sitting there thinking, Can God really use, nobody knows me. Did you know that the greatest people movement to the gospel in the first century happened in a city that arguably gave us the most influential New Testament church and nobody even knows who started it? I want you to take your Bible, open it to Acts chapter 11. Nobody famous is attached to the launching of this church in Antioch. Acts chapter 11, I think we got these verses that may go on the screen. Acts 11, beginning in verse 19, I want you to listen to what the Bible says. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. But there were some of, what's the next word? Say it out loud. Some of who? Some of them. Men of Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with, say it out loud, them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. And the news about who? Them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage who? Them. All with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarshish to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch for an entire year. And they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. I would argue that the church here at Antioch is maybe the most significant church 
in the New Testament. It became the launching pad for the Apostle Paul's ministry. But as you read about the beginning of this church, no names, no celebrities. Who is it? It's just them. Just them. You say, why would you say that the church at Antioch is so significant? Well, several reasons. Number one, this is the first church plant among Gentiles. How many of you in the room are what would be considered a Messianic Jew? You are Jewish by birth, but you have come to Christ as Lord and Savior. You're now what would be called a Messianic or completed Jew. Let me see your hand. Just hold it up for a second. I don't see any hands. Say amen if that's you. So not one in the room today. Not one. You know what that means? All of us in this building... We trace our faith back, not to the church at Antioch, the first church planted among Jews. We trace our faith back to the church, to to Jerusalem. We trace our faith back to the church at Antioch. Antioch is the first time the gospel was planted among Gentiles and a Gentile church was born. Every one of us trace our faith heritage back to this church. I don't know about you, that makes it a pretty significant church to me. Number two, this is the first place disciples were called Christians. Christians. Now, you and I wear that badge today as a label of honor. I am a Christian, but you need to understand the Bible doesn't say they called themselves Christians. The Bible says this is the first place they were called Christians, meaning this, the expression of the gospel taking place in Antioch was so radical that when lost people saw them, the only thing they could describe them as is those Jesus people. They're so like Christ, they're Christian. Here's a third reason it's so significant. This is the first church that sent out missionaries on purpose. You say, wait a minute, what about the people that came here to plant this church? They didn't come here on purpose. They left Jerusalem because God turned the heat up in Jerusalem. God had given them the commission in Jerusalem to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, but you know what they did? They huddled up and kept it right there. So God sent persecution. That's why this chapter opens by describing these people got here not by being sent out. They got here by being scattered from the persecution that occurred in response to Stephen's preaching the gospel. But in Antioch, by the time we get to chapter 13, this church understood the mission they commission Paul and Barnabas they send them out and become the centerpiece of all of the missionary journeys of Paul all of the church planting that goes to all the rest of the world was centered and rooted right here in this church at Antioch and yet no names no accolades nobody in the church at Antioch even got a book deal in the New Testament just them We're going to have to get to heaven and ask who they were. But as you read the story, there are some interesting characteristics about them that I want to use that acrostic, if you will, T-H-E-M, and I want to give you four truths about them. You may be here today and you may say, I'm no Paul, I'm no Peter, I'm no John. But listen, listen. You can be them. You can be them. Here's four things. Number one. They took, there's the T, they took God's mission personally. They took God's mission personally. Why Antioch? Why did they choose to begin this movement in Antioch? Well, because they'd done a demographic survey of the community and understood the fastest growing schools were in this neighborhood where the new track homes were being built and they had an opportunity to go in there and they matched, matched up with the demographic of that community and they did a felt needs survey to understand that they had the right gifting and, and equipment to go in and meet the needs of that community. No, no, that's not why they went to Antioch, right? Let me tell you why they went to Antioch. Life took them there. There was no strategic decision about Antioch. They were running for their lives in fear of persecution, having watched Stephen been martyred for the gospel, and they woke up one morning and they were in Antioch. But here's what we learn about them. Wherever life took them, they embraced the mission of God. They were in Antioch, so what'd they do? They started talking to people about Jesus. They started sharing Christ with people where they were. I think sometimes we create fantasies about being on mission with God in far off places and exotic locations. 
nations. There was nothing exotic about being a refugee fleeing persecution in the first century. Antioch is just where life took them, but it is where God planned to use them. Let me ask you a question. Where does God have you? Where does God have you? You see, some of you are so stuck in neutral right now because you think God's mission starts when you get all this behind you. You ever thought that maybe the reason God put you here in this city is because there's people that live around you right now and he desires to make himself known to them through you. And so God put you here not primarily because he wants you to get a theological education to go impact the world. God maybe put you here primarily because when his son died, when, he, when, when the Bible says that he was slain before the foundation of the world, God had on his heart and his mind your neighbor and God relocated you here. Yes, part of that is getting a theological education, but the other part of that is God loves that person and he desires to make himself known to them through you. Are you taking God's mission personally? Are you using your job, your skill, and your, some of you are working jobs right now, having to do that, you're not able to work at a church yet, you're working at, at a Starbucks, or you're working at a grocery store, or you're working at a hotel, and you're thinking, I can't wait to get past this so I can do ministry. Have it ever, has it ever dawned on you that maybe God put you at that hotel, that is ministry? that you can leverage your job, your skill, and your passion where you live, work, and play to take God's mission personally. That's what happened to the people in Antioch. Here's the second thing they did. They had gospel conversations. They had gospel conversations. There's the H. The Bible tells us they begin speaking and they begin preaching the Lord Jesus, the word speak means what you think it means. It means to have a conversation. It means to express oneself using words. The word preaching is a word that means to share or to proclaim the good news. It tells us a couple of things about these people. Number one, they were constantly looking for ways to intentionally bring the good news of Jesus into their everyday conversation. Are you constantly looking for ways to bring Jesus into your everyday conversation? There's a famous saying that's out there, and I don't know who originally said it. It's often attributed to St. Francis. It sounds super spiritual. A lot of people even put it as the tagline on their emails. When you get an email from somebody, and here's what it says. Preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. You ever heard that before? Let me say it another way. You can't preach the gospel without using words. Now, I understand that it is the lifestyle that we live and the relational equity that we build that opens the door to gospel conversations. But without the gospel conversation, that is not evangelism. That is not sharing the gospel. Yes, we need to be invested in building relationships with lost people from culture. Yes, we need to be engaging the communities where we live. Like we are in Las Vegas, we're, we're up to our neck involved in foster care and the foster care system in Las Vegas. We're the only offsite foster care training center in Las Vegas outside the Department of Family Services. We've just been handed the keys in many ways to engage our entire city in the foster care community and we have a dream in Las Vegas that 10 years from today there are families in the system waiting on children instead of children in the system waiting on families. We are engaging and building those relationships. We're wrapping our arms around our city but at the end of the day we want to see those relationships open the door for us to have gospel conversations because only the gospel can really change somebody's life. These people had gospel conversations. They were intentional about preaching Christ. But secondly, they were intentional about having gospel conversations, don't miss this, that crossed cultural barriers. Look what it said in verse 20. It says, there were some of them who were preaching to the Greeks also. Some of these that were scattered were only talking to other Jews about Christ. But there were some of them who began to be intentional about preaching the gospel, building relationships cross-culturally. Here's the point. We can begin to share in God's mission right where we are, but we cannot fulfill our responsibility to fully engage in God's mission without being intentional to tell the story of Jesus cross-culturally. We have a responsibility as a follower of Jesus to cross cultural barriers with the gospel. And listen, that means that we need to go to the nations. But it also means that we need to be intentional 
about seeing multi-ethnic expressions of the gospel take place in our own community. Listen, it's a tragic, tragic, tragic day in America when the average local school in your community is 20 times more integrated than the local church in the same community. Let that sink in for a minute. Here's what that means. America, with legislation in schools, has done more than the church with the gospel and the power of reconciliation. What an indictment against us as the church. Here's what that means. We've not been intentional. We've been like this first group. We just shared the gospel with people like us. We just wanted people, that's why you go to most churches today, it's filled with people that look just like one another, talk like one another, sound like one another. But America is rapidly changing. By 2043, demographers tell us there will be no majority population left in America, meaning we will be a nation of minorities. And here's what we understand from the church at Antioch. The multi-ethnic expression of the gospel is not a new way of doing church. It is the New Testament church. And what's happened is over time, we've begun to, to accumulate and acquire churches rooted and grounded in our flesh rather than a missiology of the New Testament and the reconciling power of the gospel. We need to repent and return turn to a biblical missiology which engages cities with the gospel and when you engage cities with the gospel guess what the gospel is no respecter of persons the church will reflect the city and if your church doesn't reflect its city then you need to ask yourself a question what part of the the the, what, what part of the problem am I rather than being a part of the solution these people were intentional God called us to Las Vegas listen you couldn't have picked anybody less likely to experience what we've experienced in Las Vegas than me I'm a white kid from Alabama all right When they said, go plant a church in Las Vegas, they said, we're looking for somebody who's over 35, planted a church before from the West. I was 28 years old, never been west of the Mississippi River, never planted a church in my life. You could not grow up in a state with a worse history as it pertains to multi-ethnic racial reconciliation than I did in the state of Alabama. God has a sense of humor, put me in Las Vegas, Nevada. Partnered me up with a young man from inner city Camden, New Jersey, young black kid from Camden, New Jersey named Teddy Johnson. If you don't know Camden, just do a little research. Uh, Camden is as urban and as uh, difficult of an environment growing up that you could, so a young white kid, small town Alabama, young black kid, urban Camden, New Jersey, puts us together in Las Vegas, Nevada. God's birth, Hope Church, we now have 54 languages represented in our fellowship. On Sunday, it looks like a bag of Skittles got dumped out. It's black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Polynesian, and everything in between. But listen, I think we're just getting a jump start on what heaven's gonna look like. And I'm not talking about a church that, that, that everybody conforms to one standard. I'm talking about a true multi-ethnic expression of the gospel which means we're all uncomfortable at times. I'm the senior pastor of the church and there are moments I'm terribly uncomfortable because other cultures worship differently but I believe convictionally there's a fabric of the image of God woven into every culture that represents his character and his image and only when we see all of them together as the body of Christ do we see the full glory of God on display. And I'm telling you, when you see it, it is contagious but we'll never get there if we're not living out this principle of gospel conversations, being intentional about crossing cultural barriers. Here's the third thing they were. They were empowered by the Spirit. There's the E. So they took the T, God's mission personally. They had gospel conversations. Number three, they were empowered by the Spirit. Look at verse 21. It says, and the hand of the Lord was with them. Here's a good bio. The hand of the Lord was with them. As you study the scriptures, this phrase is used throughout the word of God to describe God's presence and God's power. What's interesting, every person of influence you read about in scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. Read their story in detail and you will find a similar phrase like this. The hand of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, the presence of the Lord. You'll find this phrase that the hand of God was on them. Let me ask you a question. 
When's the last time somebody was introduced to you and here's what they said about them? I don't know much, but I know this. The hand of God is on them. If that can be said, does anything else really need to be said? I don't know much, but I know this. Now, we'd rather say things like, boy, he's a great leader. Man, he's a strategic thinker. Oh, he's a, or she's a powerful communicator. Or she's a creative visionary. Or he's an outside the box thinker. You know what we really need today? You know what we really need? We need the hand of God on us. That's what we need. You know, it'd be awesome, Danny. It'd be awesome if you just sent out a generation of students with the hand of God. God, oh, what's happening in South Eastern? Well, well, I don't know what's happening over there. What are they teaching? I don't know what they're teaching. All I know is every student that comes out of that seminary, the hand of God is all over them. Bill Elif said this, pastor's a great church in Arkansas. Bill Elif said, more can happen in five minutes of God's manifest presence than in 50 years of our best human efforts. What we need today is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. The sad reality is that in the American church, we are so content with our comfortable lives and creative, contemporary, make me feel better worship experiences that we have no attitude of desperation. There is no passion to see God move in our lives, in our churches, in our society, or in our world. What the world needs to see is the hand of God on the people of God in power. And when God moves in power like that, nothing can stand against his church nothing nothing there's a um, man that's impacted my life in a great way on this subject his name is Jim Cimbala sure many of you have read his books I've gotten the opportunity to get to know Dr. Cimbala and he's just impacted my life tremendously listen what he said he said in his book Spirit Rising I sometimes wonder if the early Christians were around today would they even recognize what we call Christianity? Our version is blander, almost totally intellectual in nature and devoid of the Holy Spirit power the early church regularly experienced. Everything we read about the church in the New Testament centered on the power of the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of Christian believers. Sadly, for many of us, this has not been our experience. I believe it's time to return to the kind of faith we see in the New Testament church. They believed in Christ's word. They expected the spirit to do great things and he came through as promised. He will do the same for us today. How do we, how do we create a culture, an environment that allows for God's spirit to move? I, I don't know all the answer to that, but here's what I do know. I do know that God moves like this in response to the desperate cries of his people. And I think therein is why we don't see it often in the American church. Because you know what this, this demands? This demands being a people that pray. You need seats ever at a Christian gathering? Call it a prayer meeting. You have plenty of seats. Call it a concert, call it a preach off, bring in the names. They'll pack it out. But you call it a prayer meeting, plenty of seats. You know what we've done in the American church? We've relegated prayer to moments of transition when we move people onto and off of a stage. We don't pray to pray anymore. We only pray to move the band off and the preacher up. We don't want anybody to see us moving our stuff around, so we ask them to bow their heads so we can get everything moved around and in place so when you look up, the stage is set for the next scene. How tragic... When the apostles said there are two wings of this airplane, 
We will devote ourselves to the prayer and the ministry of the word. If you study it grammatically, the, the, the definitive articles in both of them, the prayer and the ministry of the word. It's the public proclamation of the word of God and the public crying out to God in prayer by the people of God. We've taken one wing of the plane and chopped it off and thought we'll just preach the word and hope for the best. Listen, we must be a people who cry out to God in prayer. We got so convicted about this at our church that we now have eight to 10 minutes in every public worship service every weekend. We have an eight to 10 minute block where I lead the church in corporate prayer. In a city like Las Vegas, we just ask them all to bow their heads. We pray, we pray out loud, we pray in groups, we huddle together. Eight to 10 minutes every weekend. We take one service a year and we dedicate the entire weekend service and we pray for 90 minutes for the whole service as a church. We just pray. Why? Because we need the hand of God on us. Here's the last thing I'll say and I'll be done. They took God's mission personally. They had gospel conversations. They were empowered by the Spirit. Here's the M. They motivated others by their lives. They motivated others by their lives. Look at verse 22. The text says, the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. What God was doing among them was so significant that all the way back in Jerusalem, they heard about it. And they said, we got to check this out. So they send Barnabas, and the Bible says Barnabas got there and he witnessed what was going on. It's not the normal word for witness. It's not martyro in the Greek language. It's a word that means to see and converse with. It's a word that means to have personal fellowship with it with. Here's what that means. When Barnabas got to Antioch, what was happening through these unnamed heroes was so real, you could experience it. Barnabas got there and experienced this life-giving DNA so much that the Bible tells us Barnabas went to Tarshish to get Saul. Now, don't miss this. You know who Saul is, right? Saul's Paul. Saul came to Christ. What did Saul do? He went to Jerusalem. He went to the church in Jerusalem and said, hey, God changed my life. You know what the church in Jerusalem said? We don't trust you. You tried to kill us. The church in Jerusalem rejected Saul. By Acts 11, you know where Saul is? He'd quit. He'd gone home to Tarshish. He'd given up. But Barnabas didn't forget about him. Barnabas experienced what was happening in Antioch. Barnabas went and got Saul. Said, Saul, listen, I know the church in Jerusalem rejected you. I know they didn't want you. But man, what's happening in Antioch, it's the real deal. You got to see this. He brought Saul back to Antioch. And somewhere between Acts 11 and Acts 13, Saul becomes Paul being mentored and discipled in the church at Antioch. Everybody wants Paul's ministry. Nobody wants the time of training that Paul invested here in Antioch, being poured into by this church. Paul became, Saul became Paul, and the rest of the New Testament history is what we call church history. Here's what that means. Without them, there wouldn't have been a Paul. You may not be Paul, but you can be them. You may not be Peter, but you can be them. Who's them? No, it's not good English, but it's good theology. Who's them? They took God's mission personally. You can do that. You can take God's mission personally right where they are. Right where you are. They, they, they had gospel conversations. You can do that. You can begin to be intentional about bringing the conversation of the gospel into your everyday life and crossing cultures with it. They were empowered by the Spirit. You can begin to seek God's face in prayer. They motivated others by their lives. You can allow Christ in you to so work through you that it touches people. And listen, only eternity will reveal I think it's time for us in Christianity in America to crucify the word successful and return to the word faithful. Let's just pursue being a faithful them and trust the Holy Spirit of God to do what he chooses to do for the glory and honor of God. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for the men and women in this room today. Lord, I know they come from many different 
walks of life and backgrounds and testimonies and stories. And even as we sit here in this moment, I want you just to have a conversation there in your own heart. With God. What is God saying to you? What is God speaking to you? What do you need to surrender to him? What do you need to confess? What promise do you need to wrap your heart around? Maybe you need to die to the desire to be a somebody. And just say, Lord, if all you ever desire of me is to be a faithful them, may you receive glory. Holy Spirit of God, would you take these truths and would you speak to us today? It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.